morning, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. <coughs> Hope everyone can see the PowerPoint. So, trauma, just an overview, um, it's the fourth leading cause of death um, in the United States between all age groups. Um, over 140,000 deaths per year related to trauma. Um, latest stats in Utah um, for six years. We had about two, a little over 2,000 deaths um, in Utah, and about 300 of those are under the age of uh, 19. Um, definition of trauma, any physical injury that is caused by a violent or disruptive action. So most primary sources of trauma are motor vehicle accidents, of course, and intentional injuries, suicides, and homicides. Um, motor vehicle accidents are the leading contributors to uh, our visits in the uh, ER. Um, just another overview. Studies have shown that mortality rates decline when appropriate interventions have been initiated within the time frame known as the golden hour. Um, the golden hour is a time period that focuses around the time in which the injuries have occurred until time of intervention. Um, next slide. The golden hour is a time to reach the operating room or other definitive care. It is not time to transport to the emergency room. Um, most of us in EMS thought for years it was, we had 60 minutes to get them to the ER. Um, <coughs> EMS does not have a golden hour. And we have, we have a platinum 10 minutes, so we need to um, be getting that patient packaged and get them off the scene within 10 minutes. So within that golden hour EMS, we need to rec be recognized that this is a um, trauma situation, recognize it quickly, um, and only manage those immediate life threats, and then transport to the uh, appropriate facility, not the closest always. <coughs> so survival of the trauma patient uh, depends on good assessment skills. Um, an organized approach every time, try to do it the same way. Um, clearly define your priorities and then understand your available resources, even uh, your resources from your hospital and even other agencies and your own equipment. Um, I have a uh, video to show. Most It's been pretty popular the last couple of weeks. It's video from uh, texting and driving, but I like it because it shows great mechanisms of injury and uh, some good seat size up and also some good um, seat spine control. So. have sound. Not have sound. Yes. We don't have sound all of a sudden.
Especially over the radio when you first get there, what uh, what are you seeing? Um, two car, three car collision, multiple patients. Um, are we going to need additional um, support and resources? And then, of course, the biggest: uh, are these patients critical or non-critical? So, safety. Remember yourself, your partners, your other responders, bystanders, and then the safety of the patient. Um, I want to try to uh, keep the minimum, uh, the patients down to a minimum. We don't want to be involved with the uh, part of the scene. So. Scene situation, how does the scene look? We went over that. What kind of hazards are there? Um, do I have power lines? Do I have water? Um, any other hazards? How many patients? Um, in the last in that video, um, 
how many patients did you count? That was a lot. And uh, how many uh, were probably uh, deceased? Where are they? <laughs> you know, extrication is needed. Uh, what kind of mechanism, what special needs do I need? Um, additional ambulances, helicopters, um, immediate actions required. They got right in there and watched the video and did good C spine control. Of course, report your, um, your size up. If you have to, come back over the radio, give the dispatcher uh, more info that you found out. So what's your uh, radio size up a this incident? Um, two vehicle collision, delivery truck, four-door passenger car. Also, I thought this was good, it's, uh, it's raining, okay, which is going to put a big hamper on um, additional resources. Can we get a helicopter in there because of the weather? So initial assessment, your primary survey. First, find and correct life threats, your ABCs. Most obvious or dramatic injuries that you usually see is usually not what's killing the patient. What's killing the patient is usually something hidden. If life, if life threat presents, Correct it there. If it can be corrected, <clears throat> oxygenate, ventilate, okay, check for perfusion, and rapid transport. <clears throat> Ask the question, are these patients critical or non-critical? Are they sick or not sick? <clears throat> With critical trauma, you may never get past this primary survey. Okay, airway. Always do your airway with C spine control. You noticed in the video they did great C spine control while doing airway. They talk to the patient. Okay, you don't need a C collar yet if you don't have it. Okay, return the head to the neutral position. Stabilize and try to load the patient. Open the airway with still C spine control. If you hear noisy breathing, it's usually obstructed breathing. But not all obstructed breathing is noisy. The airway is a manpower intensive task. So always get the manpower coming as quickly as possible. Anticipate airway problems with decreased level of consciousness, head trauma, facial trauma, neck trauma, thorax trauma, especially in the upper and severe burns of any area. Um, you see any of these, you know, anticipate you're going to have an airway problem. Um, have your airway kit out. Have your innovation ready. Keep your airway open, clear, and maintain it. Breathing. <coughs> ask the question, is the oxygen getting to the blood? It's not just that they have an airway and that they are breathing. It's, is it getting to the bloodstream? Is, it, is air moving? Okay. Is it moving adequately? <coughs> and is it at an adequate rate also? Moving look, listen, and feel. Oxygenate immediately. Always put oxygen on the trauma patient if they have a decreased level of consciousness, if they're in shock. If they're bleeding severely, if they have chest pain, if they have chest trauma, if they're having difficulty breathing or respiratory distress, or if they just have multiple trauma, oxygen is not going to hurt them. Okay? If you even think about giving oxygen, just give it. So consider assisting ventilations in the trauma patient if respirations are below 12 or more than 24. And again, are they breathing adequately? Is the tidal volume adequate? If it's decreased, consider it helping them out. Okay. And if their respiratory effort is increasing, if it's above 24, again, consider helping them out. Okay. If you can't tell ventilations are adequate, they're not. Okay. Let's help them, help the patient out. 
the formulations or are compromised in the trauma patient, exposed, palpate, and auscultate the chest. Okay. This is kind of big for us in the ER. You've got to expose the patient to be able to see what, the, what injuries there are. A lot of chest injuries are missed because they're afraid to expose the patient. Okay. Circulation is the heart beating. Serious external bleeding. And I always ask, is the patient perfusing? Okay. So how do we know if the patient's perfusing? Okay. Great way is to check the radial pulse. Okay. If there's not a radial pulse, the systolic is below 80. Okay. Check the carotid pulse. If you don't have a radial pulse, if you don't have a carotid pulse, it's below 60. Great way to tell if they're perfusing. Okay. There's no carotid pulse. Hurry and extricate. Start CPR. Consider mast if it's in your protocols. And get out of there. Okay. Survival rate from a cardiac arrest. Secondary trauma is very low. Again, is the patient perfusing? Are they cool, pale, moist skin? Is it shock? Okay. Is it capillary refill? More than two seconds, they're in shock. Okay. Are they restless, anxious, combative? They're in shock. Okay. <clears throat> if, you can, if you question an internal hemorrhage, quickly expose, palpate the abdomen, pelvis, and thighs. Um, central nervous function. Okay. Level of consciousness is the best um, sign that you get. Okay. Are they alert? <clears throat> Do they just have a verbal response? Okay. But it is the best that you can get out of them, not the worst. <clears throat> Check pupils. Okay. The eyes are the window to the central nervous system. If they have a decreased level of consciousness, they're usually brain injury, they're hypoxic, hypoglycemic, or they're just in shock. Um, a few of those you, we can uh, fix out in the field, especially the hypoglycemia. Um, that sh should be checked and fixed before they get to the ER. <clears throat> I never think that drugs, alcohol, or personality is something first in the trauma patient. Okay. Just like we talked about, expose and examine. You can't treat what you can't see. Okay. Um, remove all clothing from the critical patients, so all trauma patients should have all their clothing removed. Okay. And don't delay this in resuscitating the patient. And then, of course, always uh, cover the patient with a blanket. Keep their modesty. Blood pressure um, or pulse rate is not necessary to tell the patient it's critical. And usually you can just visualize that the patient is critical and you need to come up with a plan and, and get out of there. Okay? If the patient looks sick, they are sick. <clears throat> and treat as you go, aggressively correct the hypoxia and the hypovolemia. Okay. You don't have to treat these in the field. Um, you can start to treat them in rapid transport. Okay. Remember, mobilize the C-spine. You either do it manually or with a C-collar. Okay. Keep the airway open. Oxygenate. Rapid extricate to a long board. Begin assist the ventilations if needed with a bag valve mask. Expose and protect from exposure. Again, you got to uh, get all those clothes off. Um, if it's cold out there, you need to get a blanket on. Um, consider the use of mass pants. Um, a lot of them, you guys don't have this in your protocol, but uh, I, I used them for the third time in my life just uh, a couple weeks ago. 
Um, consider a basin if you can do that, and rapid transport. Establish the IV in route. No need to uh, get an IV hold on scene and reassess. And if you need to, um, recontact the hospital in route. Okay, now I've heard delay transport of the critically injured patient to start an IV. Okay. Minimize the time on scene, maximize the treatment in route. Have a plan. Okay. You know, when you get dispatched, have a plan. Okay. Secondary survey, usually the H&P exam. <clears throat> most of the time you will not get to this in most trauma patients. Okay. Perform it only after the primary survey is complete and all life threats are corrected. Do not hold a critical patient in the field to do the secondary survey. Okay. With your physical exam, make sure it's organized. Try to do it the same way every time. <coughs> every patient, same way, every time. Okay. Start superior to inferior, then proximal to distal. Okay. Look, listen, and feel. All those areas. Okay. Remember to use your stethoscope, listen to the patient's chest. Okay. Some of the most frequently missed areas are the back, the mouth, and of course doing a neuro exam. Uh, then you go to the extremities. Okay, they must include pulses. So, do they have a good radio pulse? How's their skin color of the extremities? Not just the face, but is the skin color good um, of their arms and, and feet? Okay. Temperature, capillary refill, motor functions, and sensory functions of each extremity. Okay. History may not, again, get to this, but what was the chief complaint? Okay. Chief complaint is what the patient says the problem is, not necessarily what you see. Okay. <coughs> get a good history if you can. Okay. Allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and of course, events leading up to the incident. Okay. Definitive fit field care, you can stay, only perform these on the stable patient. Packaging, again, don't stay and try to package a patient if they're critical. No bandaging, no splinting, just get them onto a board and you can stabilize those later if needed. And once you transport, make sure you reassess for any hidden problems. Again, if you have not gotten the patient uh, undressed, uh, now's a good time in the back of the ambulance. <clears throat> if the patient becomes unstable at any time, just transport to the closest appropriate facility. <clears throat> uh, radio reports. This is kind of some of our doctor, trauma doctors have <laughs> issues with these. When you call in for a trauma, be brief, be very concise, and try to take up no more than 90 seconds. Um, LDS, uh, University, and what was the other one, Russ? And primary children's have all given kind of a standard report that they'd like to see on the trauma patient. First, just give them age, sex, mechanism of injury, okay? And, of course, the injury time. Was it, you know, four hours ago, or is it just 20 minutes ago? <coughs> The most recent set of vitals doesn't need to be the very first set. Whatever the last set of vitals are is all we need <coughs> on the radio report. Again, include the oxygen saturations, and if your agency, if you can get us a um, entitled CO2, and of course the temperature is also great out in the field uh, if you have time. <coughs> Give us a Glasgow coma score on scene. And then also um, make sure you give us uh, before intubation. Okay, list the injuries only. We don't need to know that everything's normal. Okay, we assume that it's normal unless you're telling us. And then start from the head to toe, please. Any uh, interventions that you've done, especially IV access, CPR, and 
if you're able to give any blood products, please give us over the radio that you ha or those are going. <coughs> uh, most recent meds given by you and the dosages of each. <coughs> and then the patient's uh, health history, including any meds or allergies. And that's about all we need for our radio report. Um, again, make sure that you document everything on your run report. If it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. We've all heard that before. Okay, and of course, reevaluate in route. Okay. Again, are your ventilations, are your perfusion adequate? Okay. Try to take vital signs every five minutes. Continue management and reassess for any uh, problems that you missed. And that's all I have. Being the ski season's coming up, I thought this was a good cartoon. I was just telling Russ that we saw our first ski injury just last week, and I couldn't figure out how, and ended up he got off the plane from Argentina. <laughs> but it was our first of the season. So. Thank you, everyone. Russ? Hey, you can feel for ephemeral pulse. It's, uh, I believe, it's systolic blood pressure is 70. Yeah, I don't know if you have. Yeah, and with pelvic uh, <laughs> fractures, do you what do you use as far as for stabilizing those? Most of the time, a sheet. <laughs> so most. Time Some of, sheet. Uh, I mean, it's really common now to have the. Uh, manufactured pelvic, what do you call them, girdles, binders. Uh -huh. They're becoming really popular out in the field, and I suggest that everyone gets those because use them in the ER. They've been wonderful. <laughs> but, of course, we have to improvise a lot of times out in the field, so a sheet is good if you don't have a pelvic binder. You want to ask that first question? I don't know if everyone heard that first one. Uh, it was just, I, the question I had was with uh, fem uh, femoral pulses. I mean, in the ER, we use those. That's our, our first uh, thing that we palpate. They usually don't go to the radial and that because, they're, you know, we're looking at trauma ones and trauma twos that are real shocky or uh, unstable. Uh, right. and, that. and I was just wondering, you know, because you mentioned radial and... Uh, the radial is just a good one on all patients. That's the first thing I do when I come up to a patient. I just grab their, their wrist and start talking to them. And if I don't have that, then I know that I'm not staying. <laughs> And uh, with your airways, if let's say you, you have problems with, how frequently do you use the um, the nasal trumpets and the oral airways? Is that is that something that I mean I don't see it as much as I yeah, used I don't to. see it as much in the field. It's you know either an, an oral airway or intubate. You know, basics can't intubate, so they just like the oral. But I, yeah, because I, I mean think, a lot of these folks are out and you know they don't have intubation. I think it's, a good, I think it's something to consider out there for a lot of agencies that they don't use yeah. as much as they should. Yeah. Are there other airway adjuncts that they can use? or is that? Oh, I think there's tons out there. <laughs> it's just what your agency can um, allow you to do. I know LMAs are kind of becoming popular. And on your protocols on your fluids, are you pretty much giving the, like, if they're, if they're shocky, They've got the pressure below, you know, the 90, uh, and that. Are you giving them the, the like a two-liter fluid bolus with that of the crystalloids? So the new protocols just to say to keep the blood pressure above, just to keep it around 100, because of well, how much we're dumping into patients, and of course it doesn't. It's not very well for oxygenating the blood. It doesn't carry the oxygen. Um, it just, yeah, we usually, especially in around the Wasatch Valley is just dump it in because we only have 10, 15 minute transport times. But all the new stuff I've seen is try to keep the blood pressure around 90 to 100. It's perfusing. That's all you need. IOs, they... Oh, I think IOs are becoming really popular, especially with the easy IOs. Uh -huh. We love them in the ER. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the field, they're... They're starting to use them more. Yeah. I mean, why not have that? I mean, they're so easy, and they're so easy to teach people to use. 
the EMTs and the ER are the ones that are responsible for doing the IOs, not the doctors, not the nurses. It's simple. That's something to consider for all agencies is if you are if you can do IOs, man, look at that easy IO drill. Wow. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you.